Good evening, everyone. My name is Mara Bernstein. Uh, I am the Advancement Associate at Indiana University Libraries. I am so pleased to welcome you here this evening. Uh, we are still welcoming just a few other folks uh, this tonight. Um, so we will get started officially in just one moment. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to Hoosier Music and Culture, exploring the collection of the archives of traditional music. My name is Mara Bernstein. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I am the Advancement Associate for Indiana University Libraries, and I have the wonderful pleasure of working with just these amazing folks who do things with music and culture that make all of the teaching, learning, and research at Indiana University really come alive, um, and it's really fantastic. So this evening, if you would please keep yourself muted um, just for the uh, ease of uh, the presentation. Also, we are recording, and this recording will be available later. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, as some folks are already doing and connecting. It's really wonderful to see. We'd love to see your name, your IU affiliation, and where you're watching from. Uh, please also feel free to use the chat to ask questions throughout the program. Um, and then following the presentation, uh, there will definitely be time for Q&A. Um, it'll probably start around 7.45-ish. Um, and we are super pleased to have you here with us. And Thank you for bearing with me. I have a small technical challenge. Uh, I would like to read the land acknowledgement. Indiana University wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We are dedicated to amplifying indigenous voices and perspectives, improving community relationships, correcting the narrative and making the IU Bloomington campus a more supportive and inclusive place for native and indigenous students, faculty and staff. All right, thank you so much. And with that, I would love to introduce to you uh, your presenters for this evening, Alan Burdett and Allison McClanahan. Alan Burdett holds a PhD in folklore and ethnomusicology and has been director of the Archives of, of Traditional Music since 2007. A native Hoosier, he has conducted research on German American singing societies in Southern Indiana. He was part of the initial team that developed what became IU's Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, which has now digitally preserved nearly 350,000 audio and video recordings at Indiana University. Allison McClanahan received her Master of Library Science with specializations in music librarianship and archives and records management from Indiana University Bloomington in 2016, and has been the collections and catalog cataloging librarian at the Archives of Traditional Music since 2017. At the ATM, she is responsible for reference, library maintenance, cataloging, collection management, and instruction and outreach. Her interests include representation and description of marginalized groups in cataloging and description systems, audiovisual and ethnographic field collection cataloging, and the intersections of public and technical services in libraries and archives. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my wonderful colleagues, Alan and Allison. Thank you. Well, we wanna thank Mara Bernstein at the libraries for helping to organize this event. And we wanna thank everyone out there for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our librarian, Allison McClanahan, who's going to uh, get things started tonight. Great, thanks so much. So to get us started, in today's presentation portion of today's event, we will give a very brief overview of the Archives of Traditional Music or the ATM as we call it sometimes. Um, and we'll discuss collection and documentation of Indiana collections, followed by some examples of Indiana collections being used in teaching and research and what many of you are probably looking forward to, a sample of Indiana collections at the ATM with audio examples. Please note that you may need to adjust your volume up or down as we go along with the audio examples as you feel comfortable. 
We will finish out how we find collections at the ATM and then give you time to ask your questions. So to start us off, that very brief overview. So the ATM is one of the largest university-based ethnographic audiovisual archives in the United States. We were started by George Herzog while he was a postdoc at Columbia University in the 1930s. And then when he joined IU faculty in 1948, he brought the collection with him. We were formally established at IU Bloomington in 1954. Our collections cover an international scope and have a broad range of disciplines covered, including folklore, ethnomusicology, linguistic anthropology, area studies, and early popular music. Because of that international scope, we have over 300 languages represented in ATM collections from around the world. We had different kinds of materials as well, including field, commercial, and broadcast recordings, as well as transcripts, manuscripts, accompanying documentation, print materials, photographs, and ephemera. Some of our collection strengths include African studies in the African diaspora, Native American collections, Indiana music and culture, which we're discussing today, early jazz, and Hoagy Carmichael, who we will also discuss today. So I will turn it over to Alan. Well, we just want to point out that while we are a large internationally oriented archive, because of our historically close connection to the folklore and ethnomusicology program at IU, uh, the archive early on collected Indiana material and it became uh, clear that collecting a wide variety of Indiana material uh, should be an important part of our mission as it continues to be. Uh, and we put together a couple of maps just to give you a sense of the, the distribution of field collections uh, here at the archives. And you can see the, the dots on the map show you, um, you know, roughly where these collections were, were made over the course of uh, the archives collecting history, basically from the, the late thirties up to the present. And if uh, we go to our next slide, uh, we can see another map that gives you a different view of it. It shows the density of the number of collections in particular areas. So you can see there's more collections from up around the uh, Chicago area and Indianapolis than there are out in uh, certain rural areas across the state. So those two together uh, should give you a, a rough sense of how the Indiana field collections are distributed uh, in uh, the archives here. Sorry to interrupt you, Alan. Did I accidentally move a slide too quickly earlier and this content? No, nope. Okay, great. So some of our Indiana related collections have been used in really interesting ways by students and researchers at IU. And today I'm just gonna to touch on a couple of very few examples. So first, American Roots Music, which was offered by Dr. Jenny Gubner, um, and that was through the Folklore and Ethnomusicology Department, but it was an elective for undergraduate and graduate students from a variety of different departments and disciplines from ethnomusicology to mathematics. We hosted the course at the ATM in the Hoagie Carmichael Room, and some of those collections used by the students were from our Indiana collections of folk music. One way the collections were used was through performance at an IU First Thursday Festival. Students had learned songs from recordings held at the Archives Traditional Music and then taught them to each other in a seminar type format in the class. They then performed at the First Thursday Festival and engaged with the general public by supplying the music for square and contra dancing demonstrations. Indiana collections, predominantly the Hoagie Carmichael collection, have also been used by graduate and doctoral students in the music education courses in Jacobs School of Music both as examples during library instruction sessions and as the topic for research projects, such as one student who used Hoagie Carmichael materials to complete multiple research projects over the last few years, such as various presentations, a radio interview with WFIU, using the manuscripts to make scores and parts and record with the Indiana, Indianapolis Youth Orchestra, and most recently presenting this year at the Jazz Education Network National Convention. And as a final example, this past spring, I worked with the Information and Library Science and Folklore faculty member, Dr. Barbara Hillers for the course Folklore Archives in the Digital Age, which emphasized using archival materials from the Archives of Traditional Music and Indiana University Archives to create a final project, including a theoretical project, a program, or some kind of academic output of their choosing. 
Multiple students used ATM materials from Indiana, such as this student who used recordings made in Cass County in Indiana. They produced a transcript of tape contents, a track index, and planned a theoretical event and grant project for the Cass County Public Library to record oral histories such as those found in the collection they were working with. Students and scholars have found so many different interesting projects using ATM collections, and we just really encourage anyone who's interested to see what's at the ATM or you know, out there at other institutions um, to think about what can be done with primary sources such as those held at the ATM when doing research and instruction. So what I'm sure you are all here for um, is a sample of Indiana collections at the ATM and Alan will start us off. So we'll uh, put some uh, links in the chat, but we've prepared in conjunction with this presentation, uh, a couple of playlists. They're basically the same. Uh, if you are someone who is not in the IU network, that is you don't have a university ID, there's a playlist that has brief samples. And the reason that they're brief is uh, for copyright reasons. Uh, we can't make them publicly available, but we can give you short samples uh, to give you a, a sense of more things than we can possibly talk about here in this presentation. And then if you're someone who is in the IU network, if you've got a university ID, you can log in and see and hear the full recordings uh, through the Media Collections Online system. So we'll put those on the chat and, and uh, uh, you can access them at your leisure after the presentation when you want to hear more. So we'd like to just touch briefly on uh, the notion of regional culture in the state. While Indiana does have uh, historically uh, distinct regional cultures, uh, places that if you're a Hoosier or have lived here at some point in time, you may have heard referred to as the pocket or, or the region or the Upland South. Uh, it's also true that they've never been defined quite as strongly as they are in other US regions like say the Cajun Triangle in South Louisiana or the Appalachians or the Ozarks or the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Indiana is uh, often defined as much by its neighbors than by its own strong sense of locality. So in, in Indiana, we have to look a little closer because our uh, Midwestern DNA is uh, inclined to be careful not to stand out. And, and there has also been a fair bit of cultural whitewashing and forgetting as it relates to Indiana musical history. Native Americans were largely pushed out or uh, uh, culturally underground by the time of the Civil War. Uh, African Americans were forcibly erased from many settlements across Indiana by the 1920s and uh, many German speaking immigrants perform their own cultural erasure during World War I and World War II. But that's where a place like ATM comes in. We specialize in documenting music and communities that are often on the margins of the cultural mainstream. And uh, the collections at ATM are a testament to the wide variety of communities in Indiana. Uh, so what we'll showcase tonight uh, won't represent all of Indiana music, of course, and it won't even represent everything in our collections, but we'll do our best to whet your appetite by giving you a small taste of the kinds of materials in our collections and the work that we do. So uh, first, we're gonna start with uh, the Jeanette records. In the early 20th century in the White River Valley in Richmond, Indiana, a piano factory founded by German immigrants had been employing hundreds in their community for decades by that point. But as middle-class Americans turned from pianos to phonographs for home entertainment in the 19 teens, they shifted their production uh, to producing phonograph machines. And that led them to producing recordings that suited the tastes of their customers. So by uh, the 1920s, they had established a primitive studio near the factory and began recording one of the most diverse catalogs of American vernacular musics in the country. Among the artists who made their very first recordings there were Louis Armstrong, Hoagy Carmichael, Gene Autry, Alberta Hunter, and Lawrence Welk, just to name a few. And until the Great Depression hit, uh, Jeanette released thousands of re recordings by performers who later became musical icons, but also by many performers who never became famous at all, uh, but represented some pocket of popular or traditional music in America. 
The company never fully recovered from the Great Depression, but their legacy is significant for the history of jazz and American music. And the ATM has partnered with the Star Jeanette Foundation to preserve and pro provide access to several thousand Jeanette recordings that are in our holdings. So um, we're gonna play a sample here tonight uh, by Edna Mae Hicks. Uh, she was a Creole blues singer who came up from Louisiana, uh, but spent her career performing in vaudeville shows across the Midwest. And uh, in 1923, she made a recording at Jeanette called Sad and Lonely Blues. One of our largest collections at the ATM is the Hoagie Carmichael collection, which coincidentally is also the largest collection of Hoagie Carmichael materials and artifacts in the world with over 4,000 individual items. These items cover a wide variety of materials from sound recordings to photographs and personal effects. The majority of the holdings were donated by the Hoagie Carmichael estate, but some have also been donated by Hoagie fans throughout the years. So in this example, we have an interview between Hoagie Carmichael and his son, one of his sons, Hoagie Bix Carmichael, in 1979. After I'd learned to play with one finger, I started practicing piano like mad. And I drove everybody crazy because I'd, I thought to play good was to play loud. And I played pretty loud. But anyway, through the years, five or six years, I got good enough that I could play for a dance. And so I had a little two-piece band, just drums and piano, had one in Indianapolis. Later on, I decided to go to Bloomington High School and finish my high school. And when I went down there, I got together with Hyla Steinmetz, a drummer, and we played little dances for the college kids. And I made enough just to barely get along and go through high school and finally graduated. Then when I went to college, I still had a two-piece band. But in, within a year, I got five or six boys together and we had some pretty good music going. Later, but in a couple of years later than that, we were playing a little Dixieland, 1922, I guess it was. And that's about when Dick Big Spider back in the Wolverines came down to Indiana at my invitation. I'd met him in Chicago and told him to come down there and make a little money. And so they came down and played dances every weekend. And I'd follow them around and oh, it was great fun because after a dance, we'd load them up on a truck with a piano on the truck and go around and serenade all the sorority houses. That was living, really. No comment. Uh, in addition to the objects, we also have the Hoagie Carmichael Room, which serves as an exhibit space for the collection, but also as a space for meetings, receptions, colloquia, concerts and lectures, and other gatherings. It has also been the location of some filming projects such as WTIU's documentary, Music Makers of Jeanette Records. We can put a link to the virtual reality scan we had done, I think this year, maybe last year, um, in the chat for you. So even though it's a pandemic and the room is closed right now, you can go through the virtual reality scan and look at some of the objects in there and pretend like you're walking through the room until we can open up to you all again. Alan Lomax was 23 years old and newly appointed as the first assistant in charge of the Archive of Folk Song at the Library of Congress when he and his wife Elizabeth made a two-week trip in April of 1938 through Indiana recording singers of traditional songs. Their trip through Bloomington, Evansville, Duchars, New Harmony, Elkinsville, Oakland City, Princeton, Goshen, Fort Wayne, Vincennes, and a few other small towns represents the first known field recordings of traditional music in Indiana. Recording on lacquer discs, they visited more than 40 singers and documented ballads, folk songs, play party songs, as well as folk and German, uh, French and German songs and hymns. 
it's of course worth noting that Indiana jazz musicians and other uh, vernacular musicians from Indiana had made commercial recordings at the Jeanette studio in Richmond almost two decades prior to that. But folk music had never been uh, recorded in this way until uh, the Lomaxes uh, went through in their, their short but uh, important trip. The original uh, disc recordings made by the Lomaxes were deposited at the Library of Congress. And uh, during their brief trip here, they met the preeminent folklorist Stith Thompson at the Hoosier Folklore Society meeting. And shortly afterwards, Thompson requested copies of their recordings for the folklore collection. And then these early copies made their way to the archives of traditional music after it was established in 1954. So the sample we're gonna play is from a recording of a, a woman by the name of Josephine Caney, who was at the time, one of the few individuals alive in Vincennes who still had a strong connection to the French culture of its early settler history. Bonsoir la mère et la maîtresse et tout le monde du loyer. Pour le dernier jour de l'année, la guillonne est vous nous devez. Si vous voulez nous rien donner, dites-nous les. On vous demande seulement une chinée. Une chinée de pas grand chose dans 90 pieds de long. Well, the, the gun here, I guess, is about, I don't know, just one year, about over a hundred years, anyway. Uh, where did it come from? It comes from France. A guillemin? Yeah. A Hmm? A It's a beggar song. And they sang it every New Year's Eve. <coughs> They'd go around, they black the men with masks, and go around to the houses and beg for the, for the poor. And the ladies of the house, the, the homes, would always have to bake cakes and the party and things like that for them. And give them things to, yes, and crawls, not donuts. You get it. Yes, they bang, that's right. And uh, the, those that couldn't sing would have to be outdoors. They all tried to sing, you know, because you'd have to be outdoors. The ones that couldn't sing would have to be outdoors with a mule and a and a cart and going to deliver those things to the poor. You know, they did, that wasn't the nearest pleasant to stay in the house and having a drink once in a while. You know. <laughs> <laughs> did the people, uh, did the people of Vincent bring the song from France with them? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, they did. Yes. And they brought it to New Orleans. And from New Orleans, no, they brought it to, brought it to Montreal. Up in Canada. Well, that's Montreal. Well, to, to Montreal, it's in Canada. That's where they brought it, to Montreal. And from Montreal, they went to New Orleans, and then from New Orleans, on down here, to the interior. Okay. Here at the ATM, we hold uh, numerous collections documenting traditional fiddlers and old-time music from across the state. Uh, uh, perhaps the, the convenient way to describe it is as Anglo-American fiddling, but uh, when we use that term, we, we mean traditions that are that have typically migrated to Indiana from the South, which would have been um, various blends of styles that came from the British Isles, from African-American music, and Central European influences. The, the collections of fiddling and old-time music here at the archives include uh, early styles as well as mid 20th century styles like Western swing and, and then recordings of um, what's often called revivalist uh, fiddlers and old-time musicians who embraced these older musics and dance traditions and refashioned them uh, in the period uh, after uh, the late 50s all the way up to the present. So we're gonna play uh, an example from one of the best known Indiana fiddlers, Lotus Dickey. And uh, in this recording, which was uh, released commercially, he introduces the song. This next uh, medley we're doing is, consists of three tunes, which long years ago, I learned from a man by the name of Albert Darty. He used to be our miller. We took our corn and our wheat there to get it ground when I was a small child. Then he moved to Pell, and I stayed at their place when I went my first year of high school, and he was a fiddler. And this first tune I'll do in the medley, some call it Stonewall Jackson. 
The other two, I don't know the name, but I'd call them Albert Darty tune, not knowing anything better to call them. Indianapolis was home to a thriving jazz and blues scene uh, well up through the 1960s, particularly in uh, the area around Indiana Avenue. Several well-known artists and many lesser known artists uh, came up in this musically rich environment. Uh, you can see some of the names uh, we've listed there. There are many more. Uh, you may recognize some of those. Uh, for uh, an example we want to play, we're going to uh, play an example from Yank Rochelle, who was a blues mandolin player, uh, who had a long career performing in the Indianapolis area and then later around the world. Uh, our sample is sort of generically titled Blues, which was recorded uh, in Indianapolis in 1962. And just I wanted to say a, a brief word about uh, Art Rosenbaum, who made this recording. Uh, he came to the IU Folklore Program as an enthusiast, enthusiast of folk music in the early days of revival. Uh, he began recording blues music in the late 1950s and uh, released commercial LPs of uh, Indianapolis blues artists and of Wabash, Indiana fiddler uh, John Summers from his own field recordings. And then decades later, he released sets of his field recordings as the art of field recording on Dusta Digital Records, which earned him a Grammy Award. Well, although bluegrass music is most closely associated with Kentucky and the Upland South near the Appalachian Mountains, uh, Indiana also has a historically close connection to the father of bluegrass music, Bill Monroe. As a young man in the 1930s, he left his home in Rosine, Kentucky uh, uh, with his, to, to live and work with his brothers at an oil refinery in Whiting, Indiana. There, he and his brother Charlie started performing publicly together, forming the Monroe Brothers, who achieved uh, a fair bit of fame on radio and recordings. Later, after Bill Monroe had formed his own band, the Bluegrass Boys, and established a sound and style that, was, that later became uh, identified with them, uh, he bought some property in Brown County, Indiana, where he hosted the Brown County Jamboree with his band and with musical guests from the Grand Ole Opry for many years. He started the Bean Blossom Bluegrass Festival in 1967 uh, on property he owned and, uh, and it remains one of the most popular and best known bluegrass festivals that, that now occur all over the world. So, uh, we're going to play an example that was recorded at the Brown County Jamboree uh, in May of 1967, which was um, just over a month before the first Bean Blossom Festival was held. Then I'll do a little mountain number here, a little instrumental, and then we'll turn it over to you and you can do a couple or three if you don't mind. We have an old timer called Dusty Miller I like to play and we hope you'll enjoy it.
And we thought it was worth noting that uh, ATM holds re field recordings made by one of the most important scholars of bluegrass music, uh, Neil Rosenberg, which includes recordings of the Brown County Jamboree. Um, the recording you just heard was by Bill Ivey, who went on to become the first director of the Country Music Hall of Fame and uh, later chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, Tom Adler uh, also uh, was associated with uh, the folklore and ethnomusicology program at IU and uh, um, wrote the book about the history of bean blossom music. So there's been a close connection with uh, students who were um, associated with folklore and ethnomusicology here, but also uh, actively involved in some form or another with uh, Bill Monroe's uh, activities in, over in Brown County. All right, next. And then um, Beyond Bill Monroe, bluegrass music was quickly embraced by musicians and enthusiasts all over Indiana, uh, and uh, which has led to uh, numerous informal jams and festivals all over the state, uh, as well as professional and semi-professional bands that play in their communities and, and beyond. And we've listed a few here, uh, uh, groups that we have, have either field recordings of or commercial recordings of, such as the Potoka Valley Boys from Pike County or uh, Cornfields and Crossroads from Indianapolis. The Calumet region, or sometimes simply called the region uh, in Northwestern Indiana was uh, and is historically part of the vast industrial area near, the, near Chicago and, and the Great Lake, which drew millions of of migrants from the American South and immigrants from around the world. Uh, over um, the, the tw 20th century, uh, a number of students and scholars have uh, documented music and culture there. And in particular, the, the folklorist Richard Dorson led a series of pioneering research projects with his graduate students to study immigrant folklore in the urban Gary, Indiana and uh, Calumet region through the 1970s. An uh, example we're going to play is uh, from the work of ethnomusicologist Paul Tyler, who recorded Balkan and Greek immigrant music in the region in the mid 1980s. And uh, so what we have here is a Serbian kolo performed at a dance at St. Elijah's Serbian Orthodox Church. Hello, Chicago kolo. Chicago kolo. Gotta say that with an accent. <laughs> And uh, we also wanted to mention that uh, uh, Paul Tyler uh, recorded diverse music communities across the state and uh, it was his work uh, primarily while he, he was here as a graduate student. Um, he recorded 44 field collections and, and helped uh, ATM acquire other related collections more than any other uh, scholar uh, who has contributed in Indiana material to the archives. Uh, he also hosted a radio program called Indiana Hoedown um, that uh, focused on Indiana music, both through his field recordings and, and other related materials. And um, he recorded uh, Greek and Macedonian, Macedonian musics in the Calumet, polka musics in the Northeast, uh, fiddling and old time music throughout the uh, parts of the upland south and beyond and uh, country and bluegrass across indiana as well as many others and so his work is a really important part of the indiana holdings here at the archives for a hundred years after uh, 1848 several major waves of people from german-speaking countries uh, and principalities and kingdoms arrived in the, U the united states and uh, they formed the largest immigrant group to settle in Indiana. They settled in both rural and urban areas and created enclaves that retained the use of the German language and Germanic traditions well into the 20th century. Uh, though 
Two world wars fought against Germany caused many immigrants and their descendants to distance themselves from their Germanic heritage. Some elements of that heritage uh, remain or, or were documented through recordings made by ethnomusicologists and folklorists working in the state of Indiana. Uh, the Lomaxes recorded Plattdeutsch speaking Amish in Goshen in 1938. Paul Tyler recorded accordion players and polka bands near Fort Wayne in the 1980s. And I myself recorded polka bands and uh, German American Singing Society in Evansville in the 1990s. Uh, next, singing societies were once extremely popular across the US and in urban areas of Indiana. Uh, few are active today, but uh, Evansville's Germania Manicor, which was founded in 1900, remains active and still holds concerts and events. Uh, next, their house band, the Rhine Valley Brass, was founded in the mid 1970s and still performs today. Our sample is a video recording of them playing for visitors to their annual Volksfest in 1994. talked a bit about field collections at the Archives of Traditional Music, but we also have over a thousand commercial recordings published in Indiana covering various genres such as folk and traditional music, country and bluegrass, jazz and Dixieland, rock and alternative, punk, and many more. A small fraction of the artists found in our commercial recordings are performers and groups such as Carrie Newcomer, John Mellencamp, Slats Klug, Cadmium Orange, Davis and Devitt, Shady Grove String Band, Murder by Death, and Casket Sharp. A lot of smaller local groups are found on compilation albums such as the IU Union Board's Live from Bloomington CD series, one of which you can see on the slide in the upper right hand corner. Bloomington's Lotus World Music and Arts Festival also brings a large variety of performers to our small town. And we have both Lotus Festival recordings and recordings from musical acts who have come to perform at the festival over the years, such as Mamadou Kelly. So in this example, we have a recording from Slingshot Episode, which is a female fronted punk band from Bloomington on their album Fault Line Sleep from Now in 1999. In addition to commercial recordings, we have radio and broadcast recordings, which can serve as small snapshots of popular, popular culture and media consumption. Our broadcast collections from Indiana cover genres of fiddle music, folk music, music competitions, church services, the Monroe County Fair, and even uh, prison and penitentiary folklore. One of the radio shows we have recordings of in our collections is the Hoosier Hop, which you can see pictured here on the slide, and which we have an example of their radio show introduction. Oh, the moonlight fair tonight along the Wabash, and I long for my Indiana home. Well, land to Goshen, it's the Hoosier Hop. When you're feeling blue and weary, let me stay. Come on along, down who's your way. 
Yes, folks, it's another big broadcast from the famous Hoosier House, a festival of real American music and fun with baritone Howard Roper, lovely Judy and Jen, the Oregon Rangers, old Uncle Fez, John Bush, the Bean Mill Boys, and the Down Homers. <laughs> And to finish out, uh, we have a set of Folklore Institute collections. The Folklore Institute at Indiana University Bloomington really helped ATM develop a set of collections documenting Indiana music and culture. Of 138 collections in our student folklore collections, 63 of those were recorded in Indiana. There was actually an agreement between the ATM and the Folklore Institute that the ATM would lend blank tapes to students who were taking folklore courses. And then they would take those tapes out into the field and record something to complete their course assignments. And then at the end of the semester, when they were done with everything, they would deposit their tape back at the ATM. And this was a way that we were able to build out more collections of folklore. These collections document early field work from prominent names in various fields, such as Bruno Nettle, one of the most important ethnomusicologists in the past 60 years, Jan Brunvand, who popularized the concept of urban legends, Guthrie Mead, an important discographer of American vernacular music, Judith McCullough, who's actually pictured here with a former ATM director, George List. Um, we also have Jerome Winker, who developed some of the first computer analysis systems for music, Hassan al Shami, the leading scholar of Egyptian folklore and types of tales, and Herbert Halpert, one of the most influential folklorists of the post-war period, and many more. So these uh, student collections are primarily from the late 1950s and early 1960s. And uh, we've uh, pulled out an example that was made by the folklorist Bruce Jackson when he was a graduate student at Indiana University in 1961. And here he and Sue Jackson recorded songs sung by a pair of sisters uh, originally from the Sephardic Jewish, Jewish community in uh, Salonika, Greece. December 24th, 1961, home of Leon and Lenore Michelot, 6399 Hazelwood Avenue, Indianapolis. Um, Bruce and Sue Jackson recording. <laughs> So here I will discuss different places you might find documentation about our collections, but I first wanted to mention that one of my student employees, Sarah Ward and I have created a topic guide where you can find information on how to search for materials as well as some, as well as some summaries of collections discussed today, links to MCO playlists and other resources. So this is kind of, imagine it as a companion piece to this presentation if you ever wanna go back and get to the resources we've mentioned. So your first place to search Indiana collections at the ATM can be IU's online catalog, IUCAT. The easiest way to narrow down a search to the ATM's holdings is through clicking advanced search, entering your search term or terms, and then limiting to the archives of traditional music as the library. The ATM has a couple photograph collections and image collections online, primarily the Hoagy Carmichael photographs. We're still putting things up as we go along, but as right now it's mostly um, some George List photos and the Hoagy Carmichael photos. You can find our photo holdings available in image collections online by choosing ATM from the collection under browse. We've also been working to put audiovisual holdings in media collections online, which coincidentally is also hosting our playlist. If you're browsing or searching in IUCAT, you might see a link to media collections online in the catalog record for that item if it's already been added in to MCO. So then you would be able to click that link if you have access to it. And finally, we have published a finding aid in Archives Online this year for the Hoagy Carmichael collection, which has an item level description of collection contents, including images and scans of documents, photographs, manuscripts, lyric sheets, and much more. So basically, um, 
images for all of the contents in that collection. So we want to thank all of you for sticking with us. And uh, we want to give a special thanks to our students. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we, we have a small staff here of full-time employees at the archives. And we couldn't do the work we do without uh, uh, graduate and undergraduate students who work here throughout the year. And so uh, we put up the names of the students who have been working with us recently and uh, contributed in some way to our, uh, our work in the recent year on Indiana collections. Uh, with IU's 200th anniversary, uh, we wanted to uh, give our Indi Indiana collections some special attention this year. And, uh, these students have all contributed in some way to helping make those more available. And as I said, as I said, thank you for being with us. Uh, this is our contact information. We've been putting links in the chat and uh, now we're, we open it up to you to see uh, what your questions might be, see if we can possibly answer them. And uh, we'll uh, try to navigate the technology and catch the questions as they come in here. All right, I will jump in. This is Mara again. Um, I will jump in and help out. There are lots of thank yous and congratulations uh, for a fantastic presentation from, from several people here. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Lori Summers for sharing some of her uh, memories of doing field work in the early 80s. Um, I look forward to hearing more about that in the future. Um, so far, there are just a couple of questions that came in. Um, well, first, Lori Summers, uh, speaking of Lori, Lori asked, has anyone done follow-up field work with Lomax's Indiana material? And then one of someone else here with us this evening, Margaret uh, Crucy, I apologize if I said that incorrectly, but Margaret said that someone named Jim Leary has done that work. Um, so Alan or Allison, do you happen to know if uh, other people in addition to Jim Leary who've done anything else with Lomax's Indiana material? There has not been very much work, at least through us on those recordings. As we said, uh, the originals are at the Library of Congress and uh, folks there, someone like Maggie Cruzy, uh, would uh, have a better idea of if they're getting much use at the Library of Congress. Uh, Lomax's field recordings have gotten a lot of attention over the years, and Jim you know, did some marvelous work with Lomax's recordings from Michigan and Wisconsin, which were um, uh, more extensive uh, than the work he did here in Indiana. Uh, and others have done lots of work with his southern recordings. So the Indiana recordings have kind of fallen to the cracks, I think in part because it's a relatively small collection. They weren't here very long. And uh, uh, I know that they're, they're one of the few Lomax recordings is, that aren't available online through either the, the Library of Congress or the Association for Cultural Equity. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to include them because uh, there are some very interesting things in there, particularly for those interested in Indiana history and Indiana music. Uh, but uh, no, they've not gotten as much use as, as they ought to, at least from our end. Well, Margaret, if you have anything you'd like to add to that or share with us, please feel free to unmute and uh, share what you have. Oh, I think what Ellen said is just correct. Um, they haven't, the Indiana recordings have not received as much attention by far. Some of them, including the one you played um, of the, the French speaking um, communities in Indiana are really, really important. Um, those are really unique recordings. So. But, and those traditions are important. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, and thank you, Lori, for that question. Uh, I have two questions from Tina Jernigan. Uh, the first one, uh, she was asking about a specific picture when you were discussing uh, Germanic music, German music. She was asking if that was a left-handed accordion that one of the gentlemen was playing. Uh, that's a good question. Here it uh, is. I took that photograph a um, long time ago. Um, the image is not reversed, so it must have been. Um, I was right. 
16 years old at the time. <laughs> so I didn't ask him, but uh, uh, it must have been. Great, thank you. And Tina's second question is, once the pandemic is over, are there any volunteer opportunities available at the ATM? Well, we do have opportunities for internships and practicums. Um, we, we haven't regularly taken on volunteers, but we'd certainly be happy to discuss uh, possibilities with in individuals. Um, uh, to see if we can find a framework that works for you and that uh, uh, works for us for, for getting uh, necessary work done. Uh, there, there are certain things that uh, we have to, uh, that the staff do that just require a certain amount of cataloging knowledge. But if you're a retired cataloger or uh, someone with a library science background, uh, uh, we'd be very happy to talk to you. Or if you're someone with an interest in a particular uh, kind of music uh, or communities in Indiana or anywhere else for that matter. Um, yeah, we'd be happy to talk to uh, folks interested in volunteering in one form or another. I, I would say um, in addition to that, while it wasn't really intended necessarily to be volunteer work, um, researchers who have done work with the collections, um, if there's, for, for example, not a transcript of an interview or they're going through and they recognize people in photographs because they've run across them in a different institution. Um, I am more than happy to take any and all additional documentation to accompany our collections. And so sometimes it does happen that a researcher will for their purposes have made some kind of transcript or documentation and then they end up giving a copy to the archives to accompany that collection. So in, in that way, even in kind of passive, if you're interested in listening to material and you happen to like taking notes or you know transcribing oral histories, um, those are also ways that you could help us with that. Great. Um, and Tina, I will, we will come back to your other question about the future of ATM and what music still needs to be preserved. But there are some other great questions that have come in. Um, from Carney Strange, he has asked, has anyone picked up where Jenny Gubner left off in offering the course on American Roots music? Not that I'm aware of. Um, number of different factors, um, of course, the pandemic. Um, but I would absolutely love if anyone in the IU system decides they want to offer a course and do projects like that. Um, I'm happy to talk with anyone and determine, you know, what kinds of projects can be done using ATM materials in class projects. And it was a wonderful course, and I really do hope they offer it um, in the future. Yeah, Jenny Gubner was here as a visiting professor, and uh, she's gone on to uh, other things and uh, other employment uh, outside of Indiana University. Uh, of course, we are sad to see her, her go. But uh, it, yeah, as uh, Allison said, uh, we're happy to work with faculty who are offering courses like that or courses that utilize the collections here. Uh, great. We have a question from Joe Hickerson. And Joe, thank you very much for joining us. It is nice to have uh, a part of the history of the archive of archives of traditional music here with us tonight. So Joe is asking, uh, is the IU Folklore Archive still part of the IU ATM? Hi, Joe. Uh, I can't see you, but it's great to have you here with us. Uh, the the IU Folklore Archive, the paper materials are now part of the IU archives in what's called, I believe, the Folklore Collection. Uh, some of the sound recordings or the bulk of them are here at the Archives of Traditional Music. Uh, but so they're split up in a couple of different places. And Allison may have more to say about the, the Folklore Collection of um. the archives. Just that, you know, it is uh, split and it is, you know, partly held by us and partly held by university archives. And there have been multiple times where I've had to reach out to the wonderful archivists at university archives and say, hey, we have this recording. Do you have the paper that the student wrote or vice versa? 
Um, and so the great thing about IU and our colleagues is that we already have those connections and can reach out. Um, so I don't think that it is a huge hindrance to anyone who's interested in looking at the Folklore Institute uh, collection and papers at either institution um, or at either repository rather, um, because we can kind of connect the dots, so to speak, and, and figure out what is where. Well, thanks for the clarification. Uh, when I visited the archive several times in the 1980s, 90s, uh, I did see the IU Folklore Archive it, within the premises of IU ATM. And uh, I, I found some old uh, uh, catalog, index, card indexes, uh, which I had created when I was head of that archive, a song, song, uh, individual songs in the collection. I mean, that collection was basically three, three parts. One was all of the IU folklore course work uh, student collections. The second was 10 years worth of Michigan State folklore student collections, which had been brought down from Michigan State by Richard Dorsen. The third was the uh, uh, WPA manuscript collections from Indiana. That has since gone back to Terre Haute. We, we didn't mention it in this presentation because it was about Indiana, but we do also have the student recordings that uh, Dr. Dorson brought from Michigan State, and those are also part of those folklore student collections. Thank yeah, the, you for that. The short answer is that the paper materials are at the IU archives or otherwise, and the bulk of the sound recordings are here. Thank you, Joe, for that question. Um, and I know that the other thing is, I, I had occasion to visit the uh, the uh, the George Herzog papers in the uh, RU ATM, mm -hmm. which which solved a, a tricky question about the uh, identification in 1936 at Herzog's survey of recorded sound collections of folk and primitive music in North America. Uh, listed Jesse Walter Fuchs rec cylinder recordings uh, from Zuni and Hopi, but not Parsimaquoddy, and Parsimaquoddy uh, were the earliest. And uh, my suspicion was that he set out a survey. Well, I went to see his manuscript collection, the collections from that, and there was a folder, you know, with all these questionnaires, including one from Harvard, who, when they replied, there was nobody there with any institutional memory of Jesse Walter Fuchs, pioneer, initial in the world, field recordings of the Parsima Quartier. In, uh, and uh, once we found out at the Library of Congress, ha ha, we uh, got that collection and a few others from them at the Library of Congress. I remember Bob Carnillo, chief engineer, putting on the one of the wax cylinders from that definitely labeled Possum Aquati and uh, hearing the dream dance song that had that Fuchs had transcribed in three different articles. It's always a remarkable thing to uh, hear uh, these early sound recordings. And uh, the earliest Fuchs had had us, his, he did it the right way. He started out with this announcement. This is uh, Passamaquoddy Indians, uh, Calais, Maine, March 18th, 1890. And the previous literature headed at 1889. But there he was. We can't dispute that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, that is, that's really adding to this great conversation we have here. We do have a couple more questions from other folks. Uh, from Heather Calloway. Um, I really appreciate this question, Heather. Thank you so much. So for Alan and Allison, do either of you have a favorite recording? This is probably my least favorite question because there's, you know, over a hundred thousand uh, recordings in the archive of traditional music. And so it's really hard to just be like this one. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily my favorite, but 
um, I have memory of it, so I guess I'll just say it. Um, it was early on in my time at the Archives of Traditional Music, and I was trying to work my way through cataloging some of the backlog collections that had been completely processed and I could catalog them. Um, and I had somehow come across a broadcast recording um, from New York and it said Duke Ellington funeral. And I said, what? Um, and it turns out that in our collections, we had um, a open reel tape copy recorded from the radio where they had broadcast Duke Ellington's funeral, including all of the people who did eulogies and, and talked about it and performed at the funeral. And so it was, as I said earlier, you know, these broadcast collections are such wonderful little time capsules, right? Because it's happening instantaneously. Um, and I just thought it was so cool, you know, early on, right? In uh, my time to just come across it and within the collection and better describe it so others could find it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to disappoint Heather and say, uh, I don't have a favorite. There's just so many things uh, just if, just if we're just speaking about the Indiana materials, there's so many interesting things in the collection here. Some things I really like. There were certainly recordings that we couldn't include for the sake of time. Uh, uh, Bruce Jackson's recordings in uh, the Michigan City Penitentiary uh, are really some marvelous uh, sound recordings. Uh, uh, there's lots of great fiddlers and old-time musicians recorded. I'm a banjo player myself, so I, uh, I love that stuff. The, the uh, Bill Ivey recording of Bill Monroe performing at the Brown County Jamboree. There's some incredible performances in, in that longer recording. Uh, so the, the playlist that uh, we've given you a link to in some ways reflects uh, uh, my favorites. <laughs> it's a long list, uh, and it's, uh, but I can't pick one. All right, excellent. I, I think those are those are great answers. Um, not disappointing at all. Um, I do want to ask uh, a little bit about, um, I, I'm wondering if you can share with us uh, what kind of work you do with faculty for teaching and learning um, and working with faculty in the classroom setting. Um, so basically, uh, if you have a story from the primary source immersion program and helping to design a course, or you can share with us some stories of students coming to visit. And if that, if that visit sparked a really unique project for them or something that went beyond a semester project and launched a career, any of those fun stories to share. Uh, so I really enjoyed participating in the primary source immersion program um, and the late Dr. Patrice Maduro Ward Steinem. Um, she brought um, her historical research and music education course to the ATM as part of uh, PSIP. Um, and she ended up bringing every single class she offered after that every semester. And I knew I could count on an email from her saying, hey, I'm teaching this class. Here are the students' backgrounds. I know you can find something that they're going to find interesting. And so I was able to actually pull collections, you know, for this person because they played violin or this person because they're from Brazil or this person because they were really interested in music from China. Um, and so I was really able to kind of like cater the collections that I presented to the students in instruction sessions to what they were interested in. And that's one of my favorite parts about having this job at such a wonderful international scope collection is that you can find things that almost anybody is going to find interesting when they're doing this work. Um, and one of the students in that class was the student that I showed during the um, section about teaching. And very much so, um, it kind of launched a career, so to speak. Um, that student actually changed their dissertation topic to work with the Hoagie Carmichael materials. Um, and so she is now working on a dissertation using these manuscripts. Um, and that's how she has all of these wonderful, you know, research opportunities there on that slide, uh, because she keeps coming back and using it to use for her dissertation. 
Awesome, thank you, Alan. Well, I, you know, Allison is on the front lines of working with uh, instructors for developing materials for the courses. Um, uh, I don't know that I have any Indiana related uh, stories. Uh, certainly there are other collections um, where we, where I've worked with the researchers and uh, their discoveries here have led to uh, uh, important bits of writing or uh, in the kind of a recent case is uh, the scholar Xavier Vatan from uh, Brazil, who uh, came here to uh, work with Afro-Brazilian recordings. And in the process, uh, we introduced him to Lorenzo Dow Turner's recordings from Brazil in 1941, which uh, in so many ways, I think, changed his life and, and his, uh, the path of his scholarship, which led him to a, a big repatriation project around those recordings, uh, releasing uh, two CD sets now uh, around those recordings. And then most recently, a documentary film about uh, Condomble in uh, Bahia and uh, their process of sharing those recordings and then connected photographs from other archives around the country uh, with those communities. And uh, that's, that case is a very powerful example of the impact these archival collections can have. And, and uh, we're thinking about doing a, one, a presentation like this around that story sometime later. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to come back to some really great questions that Tina Jernigan posed, which is what is the future of the archives of traditional music? Uh, also, what music still needs to be preserved? Um, and I'm just going to add on uh, what kinds of things do you see in store for you in 2021? Uh, you know, if, if COVID weren't a thing, but also given that COVID is changing everything we do, what are your plans for 2021? Uh, let me start that one, and Allison can chime in later. Uh, and I'll start with the, um, uh, boy, the what remains to be preserved part of it. Uh, as, as some of you may know, Indiana University has uh, taking a, taken a real leadership role among uh, universities in the United States to digitally preserve its audio, video, and film holdings, uh, what we call MDPI or the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative. And um, that project was uh, funded by an important uh, influx of money from the president of the university who uh, put $15 million towards uh, a five-year effort uh, to digitally preserve important audio and video holdings on campus. And then that was extended or increased to include film holdings uh, at the university. So uh, that five-year effort is winding up here uh, uh, mostly at the end of this calendar year, just in the next few weeks actually. And um, they will have digitally preserved close to 350,000 audio video recordings. Uh, the film work will go on a little bit longer, but uh, it's really a, uh, an amazing effort that um, no other university in the country has taken on at that scale. Uh, but it isn't everything, uh, at least for the archives of traditional music. There are about 110,000 recordings here. Um, MDPI will have digitally preserved um, close to 90,000 recordings. There are some things that are duplicates here, things that we chose not to digitally preserve, but there are other things that uh, simply didn't get done uh, or were on formats that were uh, as of yet, still too challenging to transfer. Uh, uh, wires were put on the back burner, for example. Um, and uh, so, and then we get new material in all the time. So there's some uh, work on our part to get external funding grants and uh, uh, other ways to digitally preserve uh, important recordings that didn't get preserved in, in this round. The, the fact that 85, uh, percent or so of our holdings has been digitally preserved is, is uh, really remarkable for an archive like us. Uh, there aren't very many ethnographic media archives that uh, are in that, that can say they're in that position. So we're, we're grateful and, and honored and proud to be, to be able to say that. But there's, there is work yet to be done. And as we acquire more materials, then uh, those will need to be addressed as well. Uh, in terms of the future of the ATM, um, we continue doing what we're doing. 
um, like um, just about every uh, archive in the country, we we could always use more people and more resources to do what we do. But uh, uh, even those of you out there who were part of the archives 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, uh, I believe some of you, um, you know, we, we uh, the archives has always done a lot with, uh, uh, with, with good people, uh, great students, and uh, done as much as we can with the resources that we have. The third part of that question I have forgotten. Oh, specifically 2021, things that are coming up specifically in the next 12 months or so. Well, the big thing for us is now that materials, uh, recordings are digitized, we're working to make them available through our online system. Now those may be restricted because of copyright or ethical issues or contractual agreements. So we're not making everything publicly available to the world, but by being able to make it uh, available to stream online, we make it easier for people to access those recordings. And uh, uh, the fact that so much of our holdings are digitized now, it really opens up uh, access to people who can't travel here. Uh, uh, COVID aside, it still uh, can be difficult or impossible to travel here to work with collections. So this will make that uh, make us better able to serve patrons all over the world. Um, and of course, uh, we serve patrons all over the world now, but uh, this will uh, improve our ability to do that. So there's many, many years of work uh, to make that happen. And uh, that's going to be uh, one of our primary jobs for uh, the foreseeable future. And Allison, I don't know if you've got something you'd like to add to that. Um, just that we have been incredibly fortunate, even during 2020, um, that we have still managed to keep all of our student workers working. Um, and whether that's they feel more comfortable completely working from home and we have found projects for them to do remotely um, or doing a hybrid uh, schedule where we limit the number of students that are on site at any given time. We only have one staff member on site at any given time and all the students have their own studio with a shut door and you know we're being really safe. We have kept all of our students and that is um, an undergraduate student that works for us, all of our library um, department students that are working for us that are graduate students and all of our graduate assistants that are working for us. They've all been able to do work to help us continue our mission to make things available and provide access and, and document them and so I think that 2021 um, will see a continuation of that. Um, and, you know, our students are wonderful, wonderful um, employees and, and great to work with and really bright and enthusiastic. And so I'm looking forward to continuing, even though it's really sad that they can't be on site, we can't have, you know, end of the semester parties and see them in person all the time. Um, they are wonderful to, to work with and they're going to continue to be wonderful. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and we have a really fun, wonderful question from our colleague Monique Threat. Uh, Mo asks, or Mo states, I know you couldn't fit everything into your presentation, but what can you say about Babyface Edmonds, the Jackson Five, Take Five, or other prominent African American musicians? Um, do, are there things from these artists in the archives of traditional music? Um, are there any plans for things like acquisitions or is that something that you collaborate with with um, the other archive on campus, the Archive of African American Music and Culture? So we, we do have recordings of some of these performers and others who are prominent African American musicians, um, predominantly pre uh, World War One in our 78s. We have a lot of uh, great recordings on 78s. Um, but yes, we also have at Indiana University of Bloomington the archives of African American music and culture. And so a lot of the more contemporary um, performers, they collect recordings and manuscripts and photographs and all the kinds of things that we would have here, they have there. Um, and, and that's kind of their focus. And so a lot of that would be available through the AAAMC. 
Yeah, we purposely avoid uh, you know, uh, their scope of, of collecting. Uh, and it, it's useful to say too, that we do not have an acquisitions budget here at the archives. We're uh, currently totally dependent on donations. So it in part depends on what people uh, donate to the archives, whether it's field recordings or commercial recordings. Um, um, yeah, that's really the short of it. Uh, uh, we sort of leave post-World War II African-American music to the archives of African-American culture. And, um, and then unless it uh, comes to us from a donation, uh, we're not in a position to actively purchase uh, new materials. And, and I would say even when recordings come in through donations um, that fit more the scope of the AAAMC, um, I always am willing to email our colleagues at the AAAMC and say, hey, this came in. I think it actually fits your collection better. And the, the same happens um, with their collection. Sometimes they get something and they email me and say, hey, I think this actually should be at the ATM. So it's a real collaborative effort to make sure that recordings are getting to the, the units and repositories um, because it's all within IU and it's all you know being well taken care of and preserved and described, um, but yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions from folks who are here with us this evening? All right, I think that is going to be it for us tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, if you maybe were a little bit late in joining us, don't worry, the recording will be available sometime next week. Uh, I will be able to email you directly because of your registration, but also please visit the uh, website of the Archives of Traditional Music. You can also find them on Facebook and Twitter. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us um, on behalf of IU Libraries and the Archives of Traditional Music. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. And again, thanks to everyone for joining us and sticking with us. And uh, you know, we look forward to working uh, with some of you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>